Welcome back to AP Chemistry and General Chemistry. My name is Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're looking at special types of a bonding situation. So in the previous video, we've looked at the difference between covalent bonds and their properties, and ionic bonds and their properties. In this video, though, we are looking at some special cases. Now, the first special case has to do with metallic bonding. So we're not talking about ionic or covalent here, but what happens in a metal? So if you have a metallic element or a metallic alloy, like, oh, let's say just a chunk of copper or a chunk of gold, well, we know that the electrons are moving around a little bit differently there. In fact, the electrons are able to move around freely instead of being stuck to the nucleus from which it came. So as a, as a result, we say that the electrons in these metals are delocalized. Here's a little diagram so you can see kind of what that would look like. This is, of course, very simplified, but you can see that we have these uh, positively charged nuclei and the electrons are able to move around fairly freely. So sometimes we say that the nuclei are sitting there in a sea of electrons. And so if you hear that phrase, sea of electrons, we're usually talking about metallic bonding. That's a phrase that's used in this context. Now, this helps us to explain why, why metals are good for conducting electricity. Uh, metal elements like uh, silver and copper and aluminum are really good electrical conductors. Uh, metal alloys are usually very good at this. And that is because there's this metallic bonding. The, uh, those electrons are able to be uh, pushed or they're able to, be f to, to flow through that piece of metal. And that's essentially what electricity is. Electrons being pushed or uh, flowing through a medium, usually through a metal. And so that's uh, one of the reasons why we use metals for conductors, for uh, metal wires, because uh, th we have that very good uh, metallic bonding for that purpose. Let's take a look at a couple types of metallic alloys. Whenever we talk about metals, alloys kind of need to be in there too, because in the real world, we're usually not working with pure metals very often, but rather we're, we're actually working with metal alloys. Substitutional alloys are most of the alloys that you've heard of like brass or bronze, pewter, I think sterling silver can be thrown in there too. And in this case, you have atoms that are actually substituting into the positions of other elements in the alloy. That's why it's called substitutional. So in the case of uh, brass, for example, just as, as one example, it's made of copper and zinc. It's about two-thirds copper and about one-third zinc, generally speaking, in the case of brass. And so if we're going to imagine this, we can imagine that this is a chunk of, of copper mainly. You know, the, these black circles represent the copper in this case. And then the zinc would actually substitute in. That's, that's your green circles there. And they would actually substitute in in place of some of the copper atoms. And as a result, brass has some properties, some physical properties that are different from copper and uh, different from zinc as well. And so that's uh, very useful to have alloys. Alloys normally don't occur in the nature. They have to be made by, by people. Uh, bronze is another example of this. Uh, copper, it's mostly copper, but it's got some tin substituting in some of the, the spots for copper. Pewter is kind of like this too. It's, it's mostly tin, about 90 to 95% tin, but it has some uh, copper atoms or sometimes some bismuth atoms that are substituting in there. Uh, a very common or very important substitutional alloy you probably all heard of is sterling silver. Now sterling silver is made up of mostly silver but it has some copper in there too. You know pure silver is actually very soft or it's relatively soft. It's not that good for making jewelry out of and so that's why they put some copper in there. It's kind of a hardening agent so that uh, the silver can be used to make jewelry. So, you know, pure silver does not tarnish, but sterling silver does because it has copper in there. Now, if you want to see if, if jewelry that you have is actually sterling silver, you can actually look for a little number on there. And you might see that number 925. If you've ever seen the number 925, on a piece of sterling silver jewelry, that represents the fact that it has 92.5% silver. 
And if you see that number, then it's probably authentic sterling silver. Um, the other 7.5% of that, of course, is probably going to be copper. So that's uh, a sterling silver, a good example of a substitutional alloy. Now, the other type of alloy is called an interstitial alloy. It's, it's a little bit different in its nature. And the most common example that you're going to come in contact with in AP chemistry or first year chemistry is steel. And steel as an alloy and as any interstitial alloy, well, it, it actually works quite a bit differently. Instead of atoms substituting into the spaces of atoms, we have atoms that are actually working their way in between the atoms into these interstitial spaces as we call them. So if this is steel, well, steel is mostly iron. And so these black circles in the picture here would represent atoms of iron. And then steel has a little bit of carbon in there as well. And sometimes it has some other elements as well, but uh, mainly carbon. And the carbon atoms would be the little red circles here. And they're actually working their way in there. And it acts essentially as a hardening agent. So you can imagine that if it's just pure iron, it's able to you know, those layers can kind of slip past each other, but with those, uh, those, uh, uh, those carbon atoms in there, they're actually stopping the, the uh, layers from rubbing past, and so it's kind of acting as a hardening agent. So we have substitution alloys. Those are most of your alloys, but then we have steel, which is a good example of an, of an interstitial alloy, those interstitial spaces. Now, let's talk about another kind of bonding or a different kind of uh, substance, actually. It's called a covalent network solid. Now, as you can see, the word covalent is in here. And so the primary bonding here is covalent bonding. And one thing that we learned about in an earlier video in this lesson is, is that usually covalent bonds are, you know, usually speaking, not qu uh, quite as strong uh, as... Uh, or I should, I should say that the molecule uh, force holding covalent bonds to get, uh, covalent compounds together is not as strong as it is in ionic bonds. That's probably a, a better way of saying that. But in, in, these, in these substances, covalent network solids, there is a repeating network or almost like a lattice of covalent bonds that creates a very, very strong structure, one that's almost impossible or let's say at least very difficult to break. And as a result, covalent network solids have extremely high melting points and boiling points. Uh, in fact, some of these covalent network solids are some of the hardest substances, some of the most difficult substances to break on Earth. So an example of that would be diamond. Uh, diamond is probably the best example of a covalent network solid I can think of, because if you look at it, you know you have each carbon atom here that's represented by the red circles, and they are uh, basically bonded. Each carbon is bonded to four other uh, carbon atoms in all kinds of different directions, and so it makes it almost impossible to break diamond. And so, if you were to look at this three dimensionally, you'd see that there's this very a strong three-dimensional lattice that it's this repeating network. Every carbon-carbon bond in here is, is covalent. That's why it's covalent, but it's a network that makes it almost impossible to break. Diamond is pretty much the hardest material that we can think of uh, that occurs naturally. Now we can talk about silicon dioxide as well. Silicon dioxide has the formula SiO2, and it's found in quartz, it's found in sand, and there's this repeating network, this lattice. If you look at each individual bond between the SIs and the O2s, or and the O's, you'll find that they're all covalent uh, bonds between silicon and oxygen, but there are so many of them going in so many different directions at the same time, it makes silicon dioxide extremely strong, has an extremely high melting point. Uh, that's why, you know, uh, sand, if you think of that, uh, if you try to burn sand, well, it's almost impossible to do, isn't it? In fact, if you're walking on a hot beach with bare feet, uh, you're probably not going to burn the sand. It's more likely that the sand will burn you because the sand, you know, it it's just has these, these strong bonds. It's almost impossible to burn sand. In fact, 
You might recall we use sand sometimes as a fire extinguisher. If you have a bucket of sand, it'll put out the fire. Or how about graphite? Graphite is also uh, considered to be a covalent network solid. And this is what graphite looks like. It's basically got these uh, two-dimensional sheets that are in each sheet has every carbon atom bonded to basically three other uh, carbon atoms, if I recall correctly. But the sheets themselves are very loosely related to each other, as you can kind of see in the picture here. So this asks us a good, this brings up a good question. Why is graphite used in pencils? Well, you want to have something that's going to be fairly unreactive, like graphite is, but you also want something that's going to flake off onto the paper very easily. So as you write on a piece of paper with a pencil, you can imagine the graphite layers or these little sheets kind of rubbing off onto the paper to make the marks there. So that's why graphite is used in pencils. You could not write on a piece of paper with diamond, of course, because it's not going to rub off, is it? It's just, it's just those atoms are just associated too strongly with each other. Likewise, you're not going to write on paper with sand, but graphite actually works, works pretty well, as you can see here in the picture. Let's take a little uh, question here and see if we can answer this. Use what you know about chemical bonds to explain why carbon dioxide has such a low boiling point while silicon dioxide has such a high boiling point. Now, I know that we have not talked about intermolecular forces yet in this course. If you want to skip ahead to that section, you're welcome to do that in this video course. Everything is online. But um, let's just talk about this in terms of the types of chemical bonds we're looking at. You know, both of them are covalent, aren't they? Carbon dioxide, you have covalent bonds. Silicon dioxide, it's also covalent. So maybe you're wondering, what's the deal here? Well, we know that carbon dioxide is composed of individual molecules that contain covalent bonds. And each molecule is only, you know, very loosely related to the other molecules that are around it. Well, silicon dioxide also has covalent bonds, but look at the nature of those bonds. They're different. It is a covalent network solid. As a result, that re repeating lattice of bonds in those multiple directions, going all over the place, gives it a whole lot more strength than carbon dioxide would have. And that's why silicon dioxide has an extremely high melting point and extremely high boiling point as well. Questions asked about the boiling point. So we can see that uh, carbon dioxide and the silicon dioxide, if you look at the periodic table, they look like they'd be pretty similar to each other, but they're actually very different because of the nature of the bonds. One is just plain old covalent. One is covalent network solid. So I hope you learned something from the video. If you did, if you've hung out long enough here, then hopefully you've learned something. Give me a thumbs up if you would and subscribe to my channel. I've got the entire AP Chemistry course and videos like this that are easy to digest, hopefully. I'm Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for well over 20 years, and I hope you learned something from this video. Uh, thanks for joining me, and I hope to see you again next time.